Welcome to the Microsoft Excel MO200 exam prep series. My name is Chintu Mattel, a Microsoft Office 365 2019 specialist expert instructor from Benoni, South Africa. So uh, just again, as always, these are my social media channels. Uh, I post content on here uh, quite regularly, uh, Instagram and LinkedIn more, than, more often than usual. My YouTube channel will always have these videos available for you to watch and catch up uh, so then you are prepared for the next courses that do show up. The last time we were looking at our print, we were finishing off printing settings and we were uh, looking at our headers and footers and we were looking at a variety of other uh, types of features. We were looking at customizing various options uh, views, uh, configuring content for collaboration, uh, looking at workbook properties. So I'm actually going to open up my exam objectives. And as always, I'm going to be repeating it at every lesson uh, that we should always be looking at the exam objectives just to know what we are going to be getting in the exam, what we should be studying for. We looked at last week in the Manage Worksheets and Workbooks folder of our exercise files, uh, we were looking at customize options, views, and configure content for collaboration, the Contosa Inventory Excel file. Right, and that's what's loaded up. All right, so we are looking at workbook properties. I just want to quickly go through that once more, just so that we are familiar with what workbook properties are, because we also use them in the header and footer controls. Uh, sections of our workbook. Right, so File, Info tab, and on the right hand side we have this Properties drop down. Uh, we went to Advanced Properties. Right, so what are the properties of any Excel workbook? Uh, it is the metadata or the information about the information. Uh, information that describes what the workbook is about. And I said in my previous video, uh, emphasize it quite a bit, excuse me, that we want to try and use this properties window as much as we can, usually towards the end of our uh, day or when we are wor finished working with this workbook, or whenever we are finished with it, we want to populate its properties so we are better organizing the files inside our computer so we can find it uh, later easily. And I gave that scenario where you may have lost a certain file, you're really trying to find it, you don't know what it's called, you don't remember its actual name. These properties here, subject, author, company, especially the keywords, will help you find the file you are looking for. These words, these keywords, tags, as they're also called, uh, can be used as a search term. But specifically with our keywords here, try to make as many keywords as possible. In my previous video, I did indicate that uh, you want to use a lot, right? The more you have, the easier it becomes for the computer to find all the files on your computer, right? And you just push OK and they get saved. You would naturally push the Save button to store them inside your uh, Excel file. Then we can use them all over the place when we are searching for files on this computer. Then we are also searching for files on online collaboration platforms. If you're using um, e-learning products like Blackboard, or Moodle, or uh, you're using SharePoint, or whatever you may be using, all of these systems rely on properties right? when you are searching for the file and trying to keep things organized. Uh, we really want to make sure that we can find our files easily, very fast, so we can get our work done. I'm going to my All Product Sales Worksheet. Right? In the All Product Sales Worksheet, I have all the products. I have unit price, quantity sold. I want to get total sales. Right? So total sales can be calculated by going and doing equals. Right, so we type out equals in cell E10. Every formula, every function in Excel must start equals. So I'm going to select cell C10. 
thickness. So C10 is the first cell I'd like to use. I'm going to multiply the star key with D10. Right, so total sales is our price times our quantity, and we can push enter. We get our first amount of 317669.76. Right, and I want to complete the rest of the cells below. Right, it's quite a long list. I don't want to be doing this calculation manually. You can do one of two things. Right, you can move your mouse to the bottom right hand corner. You have a thin black cross showing up. You can click and drag down if you wish. A faster method is we double click. Right, we double click bottom right hand corner, the thin black cross, and it gets completed for us all the way down to the bottom. All right, so that is a very simple calculation. Maybe we received this particular worksheet and we want to know how was this calculation done for each of the cells going down. Yes, I can see my formulas, right? Pretty quite obvious uh, what's in my formula bar. I could easily double click inside here as well, right? And do whatever I need to do. But another way to actually see my formulas is to activate show formulas. Right, so show formulas exists in our formulas tab. If you go to the formulas tab, we go to the formula auditing group on the right hand side. We are looking for a command at the top right hand corner of formula auditing called show formulas, which is which has an icon of a right angle triangle with the FX next to it. Right, so if we click on show formulas, right, what does that do? Our worksheet actually expands quite a bit, and we will see what's uh, showing up here are every single or is every single formula here related to uh, this particular worksheet or what we're trying to see here really is how are these calculations happening? I'm just going to make this a bit smaller. Uh, so we can see a proper view here. So we can see these calculations happening one by one. I can see the color coding happening, right? This blue block times the red block. So this, it's color coded for me to see what's going on. Why do I usually use this? Where would I want to use this? Well, if you want to see how somebody has done a certain calculation, you will switch on show formulas. If you are troubleshooting, if you want to see what problem you are facing in your worksheet and your formulas are not working out correctly, uh, we would make use of this. And we're actually going to do a calculation in the next domain, uh, which will show us that you know we might be facing a problem, and we are going to fix that particular problem. And show formulas would be one of the first things I want to enable under formula auditing. What is formula auditing? Formula auditing would mean you're trying to verify that your Excel workbook is calculating correctly. You want to make sure you have clean, accurate data, error-free data. So you would go through each one of these here uh, to identify what problems you are facing in your Excel workbook. These are the suggested commands. All right, so we would go through these. This is very easily showing you what's going on. However, we don't want to be staying in this view Right, because we don't see our answers over here. We only see the formulas. So we can switch it off by going to the show formulas command again, and we're back to our normal view. Right, so this is uh, this particular button technically falls under views as well. All right, so there's a view tab we were looking at uh, the last time with formulas. We can go to show formulas and uh, show formulas again just to switch it on, switch it off to change the view of our Excel worksheet. All right, just a keyboard shortcut of this. Over time, I've memorized the keyboard shortcut because I use it frequently. If you, excuse me, uh, hold down the control button on the left, right, and we use the tilde symbol, right, T-I-L-D-E, the tilde symbol, which is next to the number one button on your keyboard in the number row, control and tilde, right? so if I do it over here, control tilde switches it on, control tilde switches it off. And it's that uh, little curly line, right? so this curly line uh, that we have 
next to the number one button on our keyboard. If you want to also use the left apostrophe, the left facing apostrophe, you can uh, also maybe consider that symbol. Uh, it is a symbol uh, very close to your escape button or next to the number one button on your keyboard. Uh, control and that button will switch it on and off. Right. Over time, you may memorize that. We, are, we have displayed our formulas. We have a completed worksheet. Right. We are going to continue now by inspecting the document for various issues. Right. And we're first going to inspect, and then when we're done inspecting, we will end off the objective by saving the file in different formats. So what does inspecting refer to? If I go to my file tab, if I go to the info tab, now I see inspect is also something we don't use very often. I haven't seen a lot of people use it. They usually learn about it in the training courses I provide. Um, maybe you know it already. Okay, that's great. Uh, but for the purpose of the exam, we do want to familiarize ourselves with this check for issues drop down available to us. And what is it doing? Uh, we use these particular commands here, inspect document, check accessibility, and check compatibility for very specific cases. So the first one, inspect document. We usually use inspect document when we want to distribute our file. If you are going to be distributing your file to a variety of people, there may be certain information that you don't want to share with them. Uh, maybe you want to uh, redact certain information. You want to maybe remove your uh, name, right? Maybe you don't want to show your name. Maybe you have very specific uh, personal information uh, embedded into the document. You want to remove all of that. You want to remove any headers and footers that uh, show that this is your document, or maybe it has uh, personally identifiable information, PII, and you want to get rid of it then you would use the inspect workbook uh, or inspect document feature to do that for you, right? It's really a bulk tool, uh, bulk action tool. It does everything for you in one go. This is not something you can undo, right? It says here, but as soon as you enable this or you want to start with it, it tells you here in this box, before you use document inspector, make sure you save your changes because the document inspector might remove data that can't be restored later. Do you want to save your file now? Yes, we are going to click on the yes button here. And we see a window showing up. I see this specific window is the document inspector. And we have a variety of uh, check boxes available uh, with very specific uh, words next to them and description. So we have comments, document properties and personal information, data model, content, add-ins, etc. There's quite a lot inside here that's going on. We want to maybe remove the comments if there are any. So the, if we have any internal comments, we've been um, collaborating with somebody in, with this document. And we have our internal comments, which are not really for public view, right? We don't want people to be seeing all the internal workings we have been um, you know, going through. We may want to remove all of them in one go. Uh, one of the most important ones that we would remove is the document properties and personal information, and which is quite ironic because last week I went through in detail uh, putting in my properties and personal information. Now all of a sudden I want to remove it. Right, so you'll only remove it if you are distributing it. Right, if you are going to keep it on your computer, you are going to be using it only for yourself and nobody else, then keep your properties. It really helps. This really uh, is to be used if you're going to be distributing it and you can't let anybody else see who your manager is, who your company is, uh, sorry, what is your company, um, your name, any keywords, Right, any information that can identify this as something that you that, that may compromise the security of the document, right? Uh, comments, maybe internal comments, something like uh, confidential or draft or whatever it may be. If, if if it is meant for distribution, we want to remove all of this information, right? So uh, we will go through this activity here. I'm just going to untick all of the other ones, right? I don't want uh, Excel to go through each one of these. 
right? Because uh, it may take some time. Uh, and some of these things might be needed for the worksheet or workbook to function properly. All right, so I'm just I'm going to untick each one of these over here. Uh, and I'm going to uh, tick or check the box that says document properties and personal information. Inspects for hidden metadata or personal information saved with the document. And I'll click on the inspect button. Right, when I click inspect, it says here review the inspection results. It says that document information was found. We, it found properties, author, uh, printer properties, picture crop information, etc. Uh, it, it even tells you in brackets here for printer properties, example, printer path, secure print passcodes, etc. So it's removing all of this private information which shouldn't really be accessible to everybody. So we, all right, so we want to make sure we clear all of these before we distribute them. Right, and so I'm going to click on the remove all button, right, and it's gone. All right, so all of this, all the properties have been removed. I could reinspect if I want to. Um, I can push close when I'm done over here. All right, you can see the undo button is not available for you. Right, so be very careful if you uh, if you are going to be doing this. It must not happen by mistake. How do I know this actually worked? If I go to file info, right, you can see author is gone. Right, so modified by is going to remain there. That's something that's quite uh, built in, embedded. Uh, but author has disappeared. You can see your tags have disappeared. The title has disappeared. If I go to my advanced properties, all of these fields which were earlier populated have now disappeared. Right, for what? For the purposes of distributing. I don't want anybody to see what uh, I have here. Uh, I don't want people to know who is the author. That was really inspecting right so inspecting again just lastly your uh, tool to be using if you're going to want to distribute this and you want to remove certain information that's uh, that you really don't want to send along all right i just want to cover check compatibility before i come to check accessibility so compatibility refers to uh, if you're opening up a file which is uh, well, which has been created in an earlier version of Excel, you want to see if this version of Excel is able to open it up and be able to work through it. Uh, and why would we want to do that? Because if we don't check for compatibility, let's say we had a feature in an older version of Excel, which no longer exists in the new version, and you're busy working with something and you see that it doesn't work as expected. Right, something goes wrong, something crashes, or something doesn't calculate correctly. Uh, you may want to check compatibility just to have a look here. Uh, what is the issue uh, with this particular workbook or with the older file or the newer file? And it's giving, giving me quite a lot here, actually, uh, inside this box here. It tells me over here, if the workbook is saved in an earlier file format, or opened in, early, in an earlier version of Microsoft Excel, <clears throat> the list of features will not be available. Right, so it tells you a summary here, significant loss of functionality. Some formulas contain references to tables that are not supported in the selected file format. These references will be converted to cell references, location defined names. So it's telling me here that if you're using an Excel uh, application with versions 97 to 2003, you're not going to be able to use certain formulas. You may not be able to use defined names. You may not be able to use certain elements here. It will just disappear, right? It may result in an error. It may even result in data loss, All right? Be very careful with that. This might result in data loss as well. Uh, so this is an activity you may want to go through if you have an older Excel uh, version, right? So 2007, 2010 uh, would be considered older. Because the 2013, 2016, we're still okay. There's a couple of things here at the bottom that may not work correctly, right? But this is more of your older versions, very, very old versions. Uh, if you do have files that are ending in star.xls, right? So let me just open that quickly here. 
so if we have files ending in XLS, uh, let us try and bring it up to XLSX. If you have files in PPT, bring it up to PPTX. If you have any files ending in DOC, let's bring it to DOCX. Right? These are the latest file versions that we need to be working with. Right, uh, we want to get away from these older versions because we may lose functionality, things may stop working. So how do I know, or how do I actually go this, uh, do, go and do this here? Well, you may want to recreate this file uh, and then save it as an XLSX to ensure future compatibility, to ensure that all future versions of Excel uh, can open this file. You can then also work with it on a mobile device, like an iPad, or your phone, uh, because if you try to open up an older file format on a mobile device, it's actually going to prompt you. We can't open up this file. We have to convert it to the newer file format first before we can open it up. Right? You can try that out, actually. You can try and open up an older file on your phone uh, or on your uh, tablet. It's not going to allow you until you convert it to the newer version. Right? And if you're going to allow Excel or allow PowerPoint or allow Word to do the conversion for you, just note that it may uh, remove certain functionality. It may result in a loss of data, uh, and that might be a problem, which it can be quite irreversible. So you may want to rather do this activity yourself, going through each of the files that end off in the older version of a certain Office application, uh, recreate them if possible, um, I know that that might be quite difficult because that's lots of lots of work, years of work, hard work, trying to get everything to work. And then all of a sudden we have to recreate it to a new version. But if you really want to ensure that your files work in the future, um, we can't say if these will disappear. I doubt they will disappear. But uh, to ensure that they work on any computer or any device going forward, we want to be saving in the latest file extension format. Right, so this compatibility checker allows us to check that for us before we continue with anything. So this is to be used if we really have an older version of a file which we want to open up in a, a newer version of an application. Right, We want to go and do a file, info, check for issues, check compatibility. So then Excel will tell you that this older feature that used to be there is no longer in the new version. You have to find another method, or you might need to uh, do this in a different way. But it really helps you. Instead of trying to do something and trying to figure it out, and then it breaks and it doesn't work, and you waste a lot of time, let Excel check that for you before you start putting all the extra work inside. The last thing in this check for issues is check accessibility. My favorite, I love this feature. I really like this a lot. I'm very pro accessibility for uh, your office documents, right? Because I pretty much come from the environment. Uh, I used to be in a university environment. Uh, I had one or two uh, individuals who had disabilities, right? And so I had to really prepare the content for them quite well so they are able to uh, understand it just like how everybody, how all other abled persons can uh, relate to it. Right, so what are we doing here? We're checking the workbook for content that people with disabilities might find difficult to read. Right, so you may ask yourself, well, how does a person with a disability actually understand a workbook? Uh, when we know that it doesn't physically seem possible, right? I'm not trying to be really offensive or anything. You know, we're just trying to we're trying to just learn here logically or practically. Uh, how can a person with a visual impairment see the following workbook? And you can actually know that they can. You know, they can see this workbook just like how abled persons can. Uh, so we just need to make sure. That when we switch on accessibility, or when we want to check for accessibility, on the right-hand side, we will get a pane here showing up, uh, telling us that we have some accessibility errors or warnings. So what is so what is Excel doing here? Scanning through this worksheet, telling you that you need to fix certain features here 
to make it more accessible. We are then told here that we are missing a couple of things here. So we're missing alternative text. So what is alternative text? Alternative text refers to um, information in place of an object that a application like a screen reader can't actually see. So what is a screen reader? What are we actually talking about here? Well, you can see this picture here. Right? So we have this picture of a shopping cart. Uh, it looks like it's on a computer monitor. And so when a person with a visual impairment wants to understand what this picture is, they will make use of a screen reader. The screen reader is an application or service on their device which reads out something aloud for them. All right. So if you've ever used um, you know, voice recognition technologies on your devices, or if you use uh, things like Siri, so you use Cortana from Microsoft, uh, you will see that it reads out things for you, right? So you have a screen reader that will read something out for a person with a visual impairment. And so when the screen reader comes to this particular picture here, the screen reader won't know how to deal with this picture. It won't know how to describe it to the person who has the visual impairment. So EXO is suggesting to us, and it is something that we should really take uh, very seriously, right? In certain countries, uh, it is law that you have to use alternative text. But we need to make sure that all objects here, all pictures, need to be accessible to anyone of disabilities. Here it's suggesting that you should put alternative text for this picture, which means when the screen reader is going through this picture, it can describe the picture to this person and tell them what it is about. All right, so we need to describe this. We have here the Contoso store logo, right? So that is descriptive. It is a logo, first of all. It refers to the company Contoso, right? So it is the Contoso store logo. If we wanted to, we can say it is displaying a, sh a shopping cart on a monitor, uh, but it is mainly referring to uh, the logo of the, of the company Contoso. Uh, so we could do that, right? but we keep it short and simple so, so they can understand what's going on. So how do I fix this? We can click on this particular picture too. Right? What does it tell you at the bottom here, bottom right-hand corner? This tool actually tells you why you should be fixing this. Alternative text for images and other objects is very important for people who can't see the screen. Screen readers read alternative text aloud, so it's the only information many have about the image. Good alternative text helps them understand the image. And then it tells you how do you actually go about fixing this. So let us use these steps to fix this. So I'm going to right click on my image, right? I'm going to see the option edit alt text, right? So if you don't have edit alt text, because this is in the newer version, <clears throat> what you would go and do, um, you, depending on if you're using the 2016 version um, or an older version of the 365 uh, application, uh, you would you go to the format picture and you would click on the size and properties uh, command here and you will have a little setting here. It's not visible for me because it's uh, disappeared because it's in an easier place now, but you would see alt text, right? So uh, for the older versions, uh, just to cater for them, you would right click format picture size and properties, which is the third icon on the right-hand side here, and you would see alt text. Right? For the newer versions, uh, you just right-click, edit alt text, immediately available. Right? And it's giving you this little box here. How would you describe this object and its context to someone who is blind? One to two sentences recommended. Right? So I'm just going to say here, uh, this is the Contoso store logo. 
Right. It's just very simple. When the screen reader comes to this particular picture, it uh, tells them that this is the Contoso store logo. So someone knows what it's all about. We have an option here, mark as decorative. What does mark as decorative mean? We have a little screen tip telling us here, uh, decorative objects add visual interest but aren't informative. Example, stylistic borders. People using screen readers will hear these are decorative, so they know they aren't missing any important information. This alt text, uh, if we think it's important information, uh, we need to uh, make sure we have appropriate alternative text. If it is decorative, if it is just part of the design, it is not important, they don't need to really know what it's about, then we can tick the box here, mark as decorative. This is only in the newer versions of Excel, in the Office 365 versions. In the Office 2016 versions, you won't see this option of decorative. All right, so in that, in, in that particular case, you would have to specify this is um, a logo or maybe just a picture for use for design purposes. Uh, over here, when we mark as decorative, uh, Excel will just identify this as part of the design and not as something important that it should relay to the person with a disability. All right, so this is the Contoso store logo. That's all. We just close this box, right? It will keep it in there. Uh, you can see that particular option has disappeared, picture two. Uh, and uh, we should just click on the save button to save those changes. Uh, so then we know it has been stored. And very similarly here, it's telling you picture one on the all product categories, uh, picture one on all product subcategories, and picture one on all product sales, these worksheets. Uh, we need to put also alternative text for these images here. It's also telling you certain warnings. Right, so this warning here, we have a merged cell, right? So B1 to I7. Why is this a problem? Right, it tells you here at the bottom why it is a problem. Spreadsheets should have simple structure so they can be easily navigated and understood by people with, with disabilities. Merged cells cause a screen reader to navigate in unexpected ways such as repeating or skipping a row. So it's telling you to unmerge the cell. It's telling you to unmerge or trying to really change this so the screen reader can actually capture this correctly and understand what's going on. All right, so, I'm so not, it's not something I'm going to fix here specifically, right? but what it would want us to do is to unmerge this so then we have the test going across in many columns, going down in many rows. So then we don't have one merge cells. We have multiple cells, what we used to have before, and uh, it is no longer merged then. Right, so just telling you very similar actions need to be taken. Something else here, hard to read text contrast. All right, let's see what this is all about. All right, so it's telling you here um, in this Contoso product uh, defined name or in the all products worksheet, there's a problem with this table here. Uh, text becomes difficult to read when its color is too similar to the color behind it. Increasing contrast makes text easier to read, especially when viewing documents in bright light. Right, so it's telling you here that you may want to use a different color because we are using green here and then we're using green again. Right, so try and use a different color if possible. Uh, so we have contrasting colors. It is becomes easier to read. We want to be um, colorblind friendly as though well. maybe certain colors can't be visible to uh, people that are colorblind. Right? So it's really telling you here, this information is very useful. I love this. It's telling you uh, things that you will maybe forget. Maybe you won't remember. Maybe you'll never know who your audience is. Right? So you'll be, you'll in, be in a company. Uh, you'll have a customer or a client or students or staff uh, in, a, in an academic environment that will see something and it is an honest mistake, you know, it was not intentional, uh, and we really don't know how we were supposed to deal with it. The accessibility checker will tell you this. The accessibility checker will say, right, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to fix this. So your application allows your document or worksheet to become more accessible. Right, very important. Uh, it is tested in the exam. 
right? So be familiar with how to get there. So file, info, check for issues, check accessibility. That's one way to get there. Another way to get there is the review tab. Right? So review tab, and we have a group here, accessibility. You can also click check accessibility. It will bring up this very same box here. There's two ways to get there. Right. In the new versions of Excel, check access accessibility is available in the review tab. In prior versions, it, can, it could only be accessed through file, info, check for issues, check accessibility. You then just have to follow what the instructions tell you. Right. So if it tells you to put alternative text for this particular picture on this particular worksheet, then just go ahead and do that. You'll right click, edit alt text, put in the text, close it, push save, and you're done. All right, simple as that. But it is something we must be also doing going forward for all our worksheets and documents and presentations. Uh, and on that note, I just want to show you uh, that particular website uh, that we have here. All right, so what is this website or this course? This course, I, I did this course over the weekend. Uh, it is a brand new course, uh, free course that Microsoft released on the platform called Microsoft Learn. So this particular uh, course here, or this learning part, is called Accessibility Fundamentals. I'll place the link inside the chat area here. Right, so this particular uh, learning part is something you may want to pursue. It doesn't take too much of your time. Right? Um, just takes about two hours here, as it says, uh, and you learn quite a lot. Right? It is a very interesting course, uh, very big eye opener for me. I probably have to redesign all of my PowerPoint presentations, all of my Excel spreadsheets, my Word documents. I even have to redesign my website just to make sure it is inclusive. Right? So we want to make sure everybody can see this particular uh, website can see the worksheets, the documents, just like every other able person can. All right, so you may want to work through this. I, I'm not prescribing this to you. This is not for the exam, right, but this is for your continued professional development, right? To understand how accessibility works in the workplace, uh, what you should be doing. Some very fancy, uh, you know. Uh, mechanisms have been used to actually portray or illustrate what we should be doing, animations, uh, pictures and videos, etc. So I urge each one of you to actually go through this course, right? And it is a it is gamified, all right? So you will get certain points if you complete it. And then uh, when you complete everything, you can share your achievement on social media, share it to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Uh, and show the world that you have completed a learning path called accessibility fundamentals, right? And so that you are aware what you need to be doing. Uh, you have learned a new skill and you are going to be applying it everywhere in your workplace, at home, in school, uh, in an academic environment, et cetera. All right, so you may want to look at this particular course, a very, very interesting course. The last thing is we're going to cover exporting. Right, so what does exporting and saving your file mean? So if we go to file, Save as, and we go and browse. Right, we may be asked to save our file in a different format. That's all that really is telling us. Uh, it could be an Excel macro enabled workbook. It could be a CSV file. It could be a text file. It could be a PDF. Right, PDF is a very common option uh, when we exporting something. Uh, so file save as, or something specific they may ask you to use is in your file tab, you have the export button at the bottom, right? And then you can create a PDF from here or change the file type and save it as a, as a very specific type of file. Right? So you may be asked to use the export button. You may be asked to use save as, right? Just remember those are two ways you can export the file to a different format. So other than your standard Excel file type, you have the uh, other option of saving it in a different type of file. Right? So maybe it could be a text file, like I said, a CSV. Um, it can be a PDF. Right? Just you just have to save it as that. Right? And then when you click on Save as and you choose PDF, 
right? You might be asked to just verify certain settings, but make sure it's for standard uh, use or for minimum size use. Or uh, do you want to open it after publishing? Maybe you don't want to open it after publishing. Uh, just be f just be familiar with these settings over here. Right? They may ask you to change one of these settings here, um, just to test your knowledge that you are aware what happens when you are exporting a file to another format. Right? And then you just click on the Save button, and it will then publish it in an alternative file format. Right? And then you have it uh, all laid out for you. Right? So that's all about uh, saving your files in different formats or alternative formats over here. All right, that really completes this section here. It took quite some time, took a couple of weeks actually to get through that, quite a lot. Yeah, but we are now going to focus on the next domain, manage data cells and ranges, right? And we are going to go through uh, these particular uh, objectives here in this order actually. Right, so I have set it up in this order. Uh, and so what are we working with? We are just going to save this. We are going to close this. I have given another folder inside your exercise uh, files. Right, so this is the second folder here called Manage Data Cells and Ranges. Uh, it is again called Contoso Inventory, right? but this time in a different folder. And you will see that it has been set up slightly differently right and we are going to be doing a couple of things here uh, just to understand the objectives uh, that we are uh, currently faced with right so it looks slightly different in a couple of places so what is this particular objective covering manipulation of data so manipulation could mean uh, pasting, copying and pasting in certain ways, filling your cells in certain ways, uh, inserting and deleting certain cells, columns or rows. We could be formatting, right? We could be applying certain number formats, cell formats, cell styles. Uh, we're going to be do looking at defined names again, right, in greater detail. We're going to also see the ability to visually uh, show our data using spark lines or using conditional formatting uh, all over the place. We are going to talk about our paste commands. One of the paste commands over here, uh, it is this clipboard icon that we have in our home tab in the clipboard group. Right? So we need to be aware of all the different ways we can bring our text inside a worksheet. So yes, we can type our text inside, but what if we had information from another worksheet or another workbook? We need to copy paste. Now we can do a very simple copy paste. We might also be required to know how to paste in very specific ways. Right? That might uh, require you to remove formatting, uh, keep formatting, uh, something called transpose. Uh, we might need to keep values. It might have to keep formulas. There's more than one way to really paste information inside. And you may also need to know very specific special paste options where you may need to do a calculation as you paste something in. And that's something we're going to look on the right-hand side in a moment. All right, but what we're going to start off first is looking at the concept of autofill. All right, so autofill is a way for us to get information inside. Uh, we want to really automatically get certain dates in here. So we have a column called date. I want to start off with a certain date here. And we're going to start off with the date of 2 January, 2 January 2015. So I'm typing inside cell A12 of the all product sales worksheets in the Contoso inventory file. Right, and in the folder manage data cells and ranges. So I want to type in this date and I want to complete this date all the way down for the rest of the cells. So I type in the first date inside the cell. I can push enter. It auto resizes my column. I have the date inside. 
and I want to complete this all the way down. So I have my thin black cross at the bottom right hand corner. When we move our mouse over the green square at the bottom right hand corner, when we see the thin black cross, then autofill is then going to be used in the scenario. Autofill is the tool we're using to copy and paste the data below using a known pattern. Right, so let me just quickly bring up a notepad here. All right, so autofill refers to uh, copying and pasting with a known pattern. What is a known pattern? So Excel knows certain ways uh, to repeat certain data uh, and follow a certain pattern. Right? So dates is a common example. So your years, your months, days. It knows that if you type out 2010, you might want to 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. If you start off with uh, January, it knows you may want to complete with February, March, April, May. If you put in Monday, uh, so days of the week, if you put in Monday, it will, re it will know that you may want to put Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday afterwards. All right, so same thing with dates over here. I put in the first date. I can either double click or I can click and drag down and complete the rest of the fields that I have over here. All right, so it's going to increment by each day. Right, also taking weekends into consideration here. Uh, there are various ways to exclude weekends. And for now, we're not going to be focusing on that. So we have our dates completed here using the autofill capability. Right, it is regarded as a copy paste function or a special uh, a paste special function, right? Because we are duplicating data, we are going through a copy mechanism, we are going through a paste mechanism, and uh, it allows us to put all the rest of the dates for us. All right, so that's autofill. And we also want to do the very same thing for our manufacturers here. As right, so a manufacturer, I can see Contoso. I want to repeat Contoso all the way down. I can double click on uh, the right bottom right hand corner the green square for C12 right completes Contoso for me all the way down if I scroll down a bit I will also find another manufacturer so this other manufacturer is here Adventure Works or WWI I can click on that autofill that down I can go to Adventure Works here and Double click autofill that down. There's one thing I want you to cover, I just remembered now. Uh, actually, if I go back to A12, I double click, right? I autofill it. I have additional autofill options available to me. So you have a little command showing up uh, at the bottom of your uh, screen on the left hand side where you are able to choose very specific fill options. So you can choose to copy cells, you can choose to fill the series. So copy cells will make a duplicate of the one cell going down. So we will see two January 2015 showing up all the time. Fill the series would mean that follow the pattern and increment by a day each time. Fill with formatting, uh, sorry, fill formatting only. Uh, so we want to, if we had specific values in here, we want to copy the formatting down, fill without formatting, fill the days, fill the weekdays, fill the months or the years. Uh, so very time specific uh, fill options, or we might even flash fill. As a flash fill allows you to complete an unknown pattern. Right? So if you have your own pattern that you created using alphanumeric combinations uh, and you want Excel to complete the pattern for you based on the pattern you created yourself. So this is a self-defined uh, pattern. Then we would use flash fill for that. All right, so that's just a little different options available. Also be aware of this button here. You may be asked to change one of these here, right? After you have completed uh, standard fill, 
this particular option shows up. Right, so that's autofill. If I go to my monthly data worksheet, right, there's another option of fill here as well, autofill. I have January, February, March showing up. So what I can do here, I can select all three cells. So in my monthly data worksheet, cells B6 to D6 have been selected or highlighted. I can then go to the bottom right-hand corner of MAR for March or D6. I can click and drag across to complete the rest of the month. Right, so April, May, June, July has been completed. I again see autofill options available. Right, maybe you want to fill the series, but fill without formatting. So you want to just get the months inside without the background color. Right, and you can then see that it fills it for you. The it, it completes the months of the year, but the color has disappeared. Right, so you may be asked to choose between the two. Um, or apply a very specific one. Uh, in this case, I chose to remove the background color. I just wanted April, May, June, July, August, etc. completed here. Staying in this worksheet here, uh, we're just looking at this objective here of inserting and deleting multiple columns or rows. Uh, so if you are asked to insert a new row uh, or insert a new column, I want to insert a column here at the end, right? So uh, I want to insert a column after December, which shows total, because I want to then calculate the the totals for all the months together, right, at the end. So if I want to insert a new column, how do we insert a new column here? We need to understand that Excel understands inserting a new column differently uh, or can interpret differently to how we want to insert a column. So let's say I want to insert a column after December, after column M, right? Excel will understand it as inserting it before the trend column or before the column N, right? So Excel always refers to, let me just make a note here, that uh, when inserting columns, Excel refers to it as inserting a column before another column, not after. Right? So, for example, I'm just going to put for example, I want to insert a column after column M. Right. If so, we as a human being would say, "I want to insert a column after column M." Excel will see it as inserting a column before column M. Right. So this the 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 term changes after and before, uh, and the specific reference over here. So I want to insert a column after M, so or before N. The specifically for Excel, I need to uh, specify uh, column N here, right? Because it's going to be before this. So I'm going to just right click on this letter N, and I can say insert to get my new column in. That's one way to do it. Right? So I'm just going to undo that. I can also select the reference column. I can go to the Home tab, Insert drop down, and say Insert sheet columns. Right, that also gets the data or the particular column inside first before you start inserting your data. And then I can call this particular column total. If I want to insert a new row, right? so I want to put a, a country here, I want to put the country South Africa between Brazil and China. Right, So I need to select the reference row. I want to insert South Africa after Brazil. But so we see it as after Brazil, but it's going to be before China. Right? So just above China or below Brazil. Right? So we it for Excel it to be above China here. So I'm going to right click on this row number 13. I'm going to say insert. It inserts a new row for me. 
right? I can also select row 13. I can go to the insert drop down in the home tab in the sales group and say insert sheet rows. And I can type out South Africa here. Right, and I just want you to type out some dummy data. Right, so I'm just going to. So we've inserted a column, we've inserted a row. You may just also be asked to delete rows and columns. Right? Just remember that you have under the delete drop down, delete sheet rows, delete sheet columns. Right? You can't obviously logically uh, select a column and say delete sheet rows. Right? But if you selected a column, you can delete the column. If you selected a row, you can delete the row. Right? You may be asked to delete something. You can also right click on that row and push delete right click on the column push delete yeah so just know the different ways to insert and delete your rows and columns a very common use of special paste uh, is to do a calculation using the paste command let's say you have a scenario here where you see these values are in dollars this is in column i of the all product sales worksheet i want to get these uh, dollar values into rands. All right, so I have an exchange rate over here of 17 uh, rands to the dollar, right? Uh, short probably should have been the other way around. Um, but what I want to do is without doing a formal calculation, I don't want to uh, insert a new column, then say, uh, 22.19 times 17, get an answer, get all the values going down, copy and paste this data, overwrite it, then delete the column. There's too much extra work. Right? I want to very quickly just do a calculation where this value of 17 must be multiplied by each value over here that we have without actually uh, doing a formal calculation. All right, so we can use the copy-paste uh, or the special paste options over here, or paste special as it rather is called. So you want to take this value of 17, copy this, paste it over this data here, but instead of a normal paste, we want to do a paste where we're multiplying the values as well. All right, so this is going to be your source cell. This is going to be the destination cells here. All right, so... First of all, what you want to do is you want to take the cell of J7. You want to copy it. Right, so right-click copy. We have selected it. We have copied it. We are then going to take this cell I12. We are going to select all the values down. So in earlier episodes, I told you about the keyboard shortcut, control, shift, and down. Control, shift, and down selects all of the cells from starting point to ending point, right? So I've copied this. I want to paste it on this selection here, but I want also that 22.19 to be multiplied by the 17. Give me the answer straight away, and it must complete it for the rest of them as well. So I have the value selected. I can go to the Home tab, Clipboard group, the Paste dropdown, Right, and I want to specifically go to paste special. Right, so paste special is the one place I want to go. I have a keyboard shortcut control alt V if you want to memorize that. Uh, you can go through here. You can also right click paste special and click on paste special until we see this dialog box opening up. Right, so. We have a variety of ways we can paste our data. We're going to see some of these ones in a moment. Uh, but the one I want to specifically do is called multiply. Under the operation, I have multiply here. I'm going to choose multiply, and I'm going to push OK. All right, there you have it very quickly. You see that 17 has been multiplied by each value here. And it's just a copy-paste function here. You can see no formulas. Right, so very quickly, I got my values inside over here. I didn't have to insert a new column. I didn't have to do a formal calculation, autofill, then copy that data, or cut it and paste it and overwrite the data, then delete the column, right? Very quickly, you got your data inside over here. 
right? So that allows you to very quickly copy and paste the data with an operation. So you saw a variety of ways to paste, actually. Uh, you can do a multiplication, an addition, a division, subtraction, right? So various ways to do this particular calculation here. So now I have the RAND value of this particular uh, price, which then allows me to do a, a really accurate uh, total sales calculation. So let us just do that here. The equals I12 times J12. Can push enter. I get a value. I can autofill this down by copying and pasting uh, the values down by following the series, following the pattern. Right. I have a little, another column here called total sales as values only. So maybe I want to do something with these values, but I don't want the formula to come across. I just want the answer at the end, right? So I can copy the selection here. I can copy all this data that I have, and I can right-click in the destination cell M12, right? And I can go to this paste options, the second clipboard, which is called paste one, two, three. Right, so the clipboard icon with the one, two, three, or the paste drop down with the under paste values, we have the clipboard and one, two, three. Right, and that just gets my values inside only. Right, so what is the difference here? They both look exactly the same, but column K has the formula inside. Column M does not have the formula. It has the absolute value. The formula is removed, just the values on its own. Right, then I can do something else with it, whatever I like, without the formula interrupting in between. However, just to make, remember, this is now a duplication, right? And this, with the duplication, formulas have been removed. So if you make any changes here, it's not going to affect the changes. Uh, it's not going to pull the changes across the other side over here. Right? So that is copy and paste special.